ओके लेट मी फर्स्ट गिव यू अ हिंट फॉर द प्रॉब्लम नंबर वन सो इट्स कैन ऑफ फनी बिकॉज दिस इज द फर्स्ट टाइम एंड समबरी आज मी फॉर अ हिंट फॉर प्रॉब्लम नंबर वन इवन दो दसाइनमेंट वॉज अपलोडेड टू वीक्स अगो ओके सो इन प्रॉब्लम नंबर वन द हिंट इज How do you prove that x k multiplied by one minus x k square converges to zero, right? So how would you prove that? Uh, assuming that x k is strictly less than one, uh, how would you how would you go about proving this result? Uh, this equal to x k plus one, and then they meet both sides, you will get the answer. What's what's your idea? Right. Take limit both sides. Okay. Then x k plus one will equal x star, and x k also will equal x star. Yeah, that's yeah. Actually, that uh, that works. But you are under the uh, assumption that x k is converging. Are you just equating sequence with lower? Yeah, that's that's the point. Okay, so uh, what you can say is that x k is strictly greater than x k plus one, which is strictly greater than x k plus two. and so on as long as each point in the sequence is strictly positive so there is something called monotone monotone convergence theorem which says that if a sequence has this monotonic property so it's always decreasing or it's always increasing so a monotone sequence sequence converges okay uh, or a monotone sequence that is bounded from below a monotone sequence or let me write it as monotonically decreasing uh, monotonically decreasing sequence which is bounded from below converges okay you need this this result in order to solve the in order to prove that the limit of the sequence is actually converging to zero okay that's all i can give you as hint you will need that result monotone convergence theorem it's a fairly uh, important theorem in real analysis okay so you should remember that yeah i think it's just assuming you should be 1 minus x k not 1 minus x k square no it has to be 1 minus x k square Oh, yes. I think it's x k. Yeah, it's x k minus x k square. So, yeah. Any other question on the homework? Hint. No. All of you have done all the problems perfectly. Okay. So let's talk about manifold suboptimization method. <coughs> okay and the idea is i want to minimize a function f of x such that ax is less than equal to b okay that's my uh that's my optimization problem i have removed removed redundant constraints and variables Okay so that's the first step and now at every point of the iteration uh, i so the iteration is xk plus 1 equals xk plus 
alpha k d k, okay, and at every point of time, we want to always be on the uh, on one of the edges, right? If you remember from the picture, let's say this was our convex set, okay. So we always want to stay on this along this edge, okay, one of these edges. So that's the that's the goal. So this dk will always be along along these edges. and so on okay that's the idea so yesterday we discussed two things first is uh, you want to find the set of active constraints that is easy to find so a of xk is i such that AI transpose. So AI transpose is the ith column, uh, ith uh, row of matrix A. So A equals A1 transpose, AM transpose. Okay. So AI transpose is the ith row of matrix A. So AI transpose X is equal to BI. Okay. So that's my set of active constraints. And then my S of x k, which is the set of feasible directions, is D such that A i transpose D equal to zero for all i in A x k. Okay, so I'm just recalling notations from the previous lecture. So at every point. Uh, at every iteration x, uh, at, at time k, we uh, find a direction, feasible direction from this set, and then we start descending along that direction. So there were two possibilities. One is xk plus alpha dk is feasible. If this is feasible, then you descend. If this is not feasible, then you have to check whether it's an optimal solution or not. And if it is not an optimal solution, let's say you have arrived at this point, it is not an optimal solution, then you have to dra drop one of the constraints, okay, and then you have to uh, drop one of the constraints and then start descending along the other direction. So when you come here, you have two options. You can either go along this direction. So three constraints are active at this point, okay, so you can either drop one constraint and move along this direction or you can drop one constraint and move along this direction, okay. So which direction should you choose? So let's uh, try and solve the problem. So at every time k, we are solving this uh, problem, argument d in sxk So let me introduce a notation. Okay, so I'm going to stack all the rows of A that correspond to active constraints. I'm going to stack them together so as to construct this matrix AK. Okay, so if my AXK is 1, 5, then my AK is A1 transpose and A5 transpose. Okay. 
So this is not an unconstrained optimization. So uh, how would we go about solving it? How would we solve this problem? Can we find out the solution in a, in a closed form manner? So it turns out that yes, even though we haven't learned how to solve problems of this type analytically, uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. So one way is given in the book. Uh, the other way is through Lagrange multipliers, which we haven't covered so far. So we will not uh, talk about how to solve this problem analytically. But I'll give you the solution now. So in this case, your optimal solution is given by minus HK inverse gradient of FXK. Okay, so this is the optimal solution to this to this optimization problem. So, what do we have? So, in order to find a feasible direction, so I'm standing at this point xk, in order to find a feasible direction, I find out the set of active constraints, then I construct this optimization problem over a constraint set, okay, which is a subspace, by the way. So, it's a subspace, so I'm solving this optimization problem over this subspace, and I'm trying to minimize among all possible directions in this subspace, which directions should I descend to so that my, uh, uh, my inner product with the gradient is minimized, right? Along with some uh, small quadratic cost, okay? So you can think of this quadratic cost as a way to restrict the length of this vector D, okay? So you don't want the D to turn out to be some infinity, infinity, infinity vector, okay? Because that's what is going to minimize this entire cost. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the the length of D is restricted. And how do you restrict it? You add a, another soft constraint uh, with the, by putting a quadratic term there. I, is this is this term clear? Why do we have this term here? You want to minimize this part, okay? But the answer would turn out to be D equals infinity minus infinity infinity, okay? It's useless for our purpose. So, because the length of D is not constrained when you're doing this minimization over a subspace. So in order to constrain that, you add this quadratic cost. So you make sure that D is always going to be a finite value, okay? D is not going to be some infinite vector. And HK has to be a strictly positive definite matrix, okay? Usually you can take it to be identity without any problem. And then, how do you solve this problem? Well, it turns out that you can solve it analytically using this pair of equations. So you find mu first, and then you substitute it here, and you find the value of dk. Okay, so we have solved this. We have figured out a direction dk. And the question is, uh, and so let's look at the first case. case d is not equal to 0 or dk is not equal to 0. What do we want? What is it that our goal is? We want the dk to make a negative inner product with the gradient of f at xk, right? That's what means we are going to descend uh, when we take a step in the direction of dk. So assuming that dk is not equal to 0, what we want to prove is that the derivative of f at xk, inner product with dk has to be less than, strictly less than zero. So let's see how do we prove that. 
So, recall that d equal to 0 is a feasible so feasible point right. So, that means gradient of f x k transpose d k plus half d k transpose h k d k is going to be less than equal to gradient of f x k transpose 0 plus half 0 transpose h k 0 right because d equal to 0 lies in this set d equal to 0 lies in this set. So, what do we get? We get gradient of f at x k transpose d k is strictly less than minus half is less than equal to. So, d k is a descent direction. So, d k is a descent direction and now we want to choose, we want to choose alpha k appropriately. So, what should alpha k satisfy? Pick alpha k in the set alpha such that a a j transpose x k plus alpha d k should be less than equal to b j for all j not in the set of active constraints. Okay, questions, questions on this part. So, we minimize this problem and assuming that d k is not equal to 0 which is easy to check right. If you solve this problem it is very easy to check whether d k is equal to 0 or not. So, if d k is not equal to 0 you know that it is a feasible descent direction because it satisfies this uh, formula which is gradient of f uh, inner product with d k is strictly less than 0. Okay? So, that means d k is a descent direction and you have to pick alpha k so that you do not violate any other constraint. right? So, you pick alpha k according to uh, you pick alpha k in this particular set and you can pick it according to Armijo's rule or any other uh, any other uh, rule you like, limited minimization, minimization and so on. What is this? HK plus what? HK. So, you can use second derivative of function. If it is positive definite, you can use identity matrix. It has to be any positive definite matrix. There is no restriction on HK. inside the larger minimization problem yes yes so this is a inner minimization problem which is in the larger minimi which is embedded in this larger minimization problem okay in order to find the descent direction okay so we have handled the case dk not equal to 0 with uh, substantial ease so let's tackle the case where dk is equal to 0. Okay. So, if d k is equal to 0, let us look at the formula for d k. 
So this is equal to zero. This is positive definite. What does that mean? This has to be equal to zero, right? So dK equal to zero implies gradient of fxk plus ak transpose mu is equal to zero. And I'm going to rewrite it as gradient of fxk plus summation mu i a i i in a x k is equal to zero. Okay, I'm just rewriting this equation. Mu i is the ith component of this vector mu. Actually, you know, uh, it. I don't want you to get confused. Okay, so mu is only mu has the same dimension as the number of rows in a k. Okay, so when I write mu i here, and I write a i here, where i is in a x k, don't confuse it with the assumption that mu i should be a very long vector. It's only going to have the. It's only going to have. Uh, uh, the number of entries in mu is going to be the same as the number of rows in the matrix AK. Okay, so don't get confused with these indices here. Okay, so I have two claims. The first claim is if mu i is greater than or equal to zero for all i in A x k then xk then xk is stationary how difficult is to is it to check that condition that each of these entries in this vector is positive or non-negative. Okay, it could be equal to zero, it could be strictly greater than zero, but not negative. Okay, very easy to check. I am standing at xk. I, I know how to solve this, I know how to solve this problem. I have to find out this, uh, this variable mu or this vector mu, right? And I can check whether mu, and I, and I found that dk is equal to zero, okay? If dk was not equal to zero, I'm fine. But I found that dk turned out to be equal to zero. So all I have to check is whether mu is strictly, mu is greater than or equal to zero or not. Okay, easy to check. Okay, and I have the result that I know that xk is locally optimal solution because it's a stationary point locally at that place. And if the function was convex, then you know that it's a global optimal. So how do we prove this result? What is it that we need to prove? We need to prove that gradient of fxk transpose d is greater than or equal to zero for all feasible d. Okay, so let's say we are at this point, xk, my dk turned out to be equal to zero, and my mu i turned out to be greater than or equal to zero. So I need to come up with the set of feasible directions d at xk. So what are the set of feasible directions at xk? So set of feasible directions at xk is equal to um, d such that a i transpose d is less than or equal to 0 for all i in a xk.
okay so this is the set so if i am standing at xk what are the feasible directions the directions in which I, if i move i go inside the set or i stay within the set okay i don't go out of the set so that is this t this t this t this t this t and the d on the other side of the surface right and then there will be d's that are going straight inside the set itself okay not necessarily on the surface so that's the set of all such d's okay okay so so we have this equation and we want to prove this for all d that satisfies these conditions so let's look at it i have gradient of f at xk equals negative summation mu i ai i is in axk okay so so i'm going to take the inner product with respect to d on both the sides so this is what i get what what do i have here mu i ai transpose d okay any question so far okay this i'm getting this equation from here okay okay so for all i in axk okay so let's let's look at it in two dimensions okay you're standing here uh you can either go in this direction so let's say this is your surface number 1 this is your surface number 2 okay so if you go in this direction what what does that satisfy a1 transpose d equal to 0 what about a2 transpose d it'll be less than equal to 0 because see at this point a2 transpose so so at this point uh remember that a2 transpose xk plus d has to be less than equal to b2 right a2 transpose xk this is xk a2 transpose xk plus a2 transpose d is less than equal to b2 what is a2 transpose xk what is a2 transpose xk you not sure so at this point at this point a1 transpose xk equals b1 and a2 transpose xk equals b2 right it satisfies that those two constraints right that's the set of active constraints here so i have a2 transpose xk plus a2 transpose d has to be less than equal to b2 okay so that means a2 transpose d has to be less than equal to 0 same thing here a1 transpose d has to be less than equal to 0 and a2 transpose d will be equal to 0 and if you go here both a1 transpose d is less than equal to 0 and a2 transpose d is less than equal to 0 okay so this is a set of feasible directions if you are standing at xk of course in two dimensions it's easy to visualize but it works in higher dimensions as well by the same argument has everybody understood this okay
All right. So I have gradient of fx k transpose d is given by this expression. What do I know? I know that ai transpose d is less than equal to 0. So this is less than equal to 0. I know that mu i is greater than equal to 0 by assumption. So this is greater than equal to 0 and then I have a negative sign. So what is this? What does this imply? This is greater than equal to 0. Okay. So if my mu i was non negative, then my x k is a stationary point. Okay, that's what we proved. <coughs> Any question? Okay, so that's proved. Now my claim two is uh, remember that now in claim two you can have two cases when dk is equal to zero. Either all mu i's are greater than equal to zero, or there is one mu i which is strictly negative. Okay. So let me tackle the second case. Suppose there exists a j bar, j bar in A x k such that mu of j bar is strictly negative. Okay. So either you are in this case or you are in this case. Okay. There cannot be any third case. What I am going to do is I will construct a bar x k as j in a x k j not equal to j bar. Yes. Oh, in figure, well. When we talk about Lagrange multipliers, mu turns out to be one of the Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so in figure, it's not very easy to see what mu is, because Lagrange multipliers technically sit in another space, not in the original space. Not easy to visualize, yeah. Okay, slowly this entire course will become more and more abstract. Okay, this is just the beginning. <laughs> Okay, so you will have to go from one space to another and so on and so forth. So we will do that uh, towards, uh, towards the end of October. Okay. okay, so this is not that abstract. Okay, uh, You should all be comfortable with this kind of manipulations now. So, so I am in two, two, two cases, either my mu i is greater than or equal to 0 or there exists a j bar such that mu j bar is less than 0. So I am standing at this point. And I found that this is surface number one, this is surface number two, this is number three. And I've realized that my mu two bar or, or mu two is strictly less than zero. So I'm going to remove mu two or, or I'm going to remove two from the set of active constraints. Okay. And then I can start moving along this direction. Okay. Because I've removed move mu. I have removed 2 from the set of active constraints, so I can now start moving in the direction where 1 and 3 are the only active constraints. So now the claim is first uh, solve, let's say my s bar of xk is a set of d such that a j transpose d is equal to 0, j in a bar x k. And let us say my d bar k is argmin of d in s bar x k. So this is a lower dimensional space now, s bar x k. 
uh, of gradient f x k transpose d plus half d transpose s k d. So what do we need to prove now? What is it? Okay, somebody, somebody, some genie came, okay, and said that you know you should remove this from the set of active constraint. Okay, whichever index has mu less than zero, strictly less than zero, remove it from the set of active constraints. Redo the optimization problem. Okay, so I did that optimization problem. What is it that I now have to have to prove? Okay, two things. The first thing that we need to prove is that d bar k is not equal to 0. Okay, it should not happen that you remove one uh, index from the set of active constraint and you are again getting uh, the 0 solution. Okay, that should not happen. So, the first thing that you have to prove is d bar k is not equal to 0, and the second thing you, win you want to prove is what is the second thing? d bar k is a descent direction, right? What does that mean? Okay. Any ideas on how should we prove? How do we prove that d bar k is not equal to zero? So if we follow this procedure, then d bar k is not equal to zero. We have to prove that statement. What should we actually prove? Any ideas? Proof by contradiction. Okay, if nothing works in life, proof by contradiction will always work. So let's say d bar k is equal to zero. Assume, suppose that d bar k is equal to 0. Okay, then what I have is gradient of f x k equals summation mu bar i a i i in a a bar x k and this is also equal to negative mu i a i i in a x k. Okay, this one comes from here and this one comes from this equation. Okay. This looks more like a strategy for battlefield, but it's not. Okay. Uh, so we are trying to prove this result. So I'm supposing that d bar k is equal to zero. So my gradient of f x k has to satisfy this expression from here, right? But for this this optimization problem, okay, I get the same expression from this optimization problem. So that gives me this expression, and then from this original, remember that we started with the assumption that dk is equal to 0, so this equation has to hold true. 
So we get this expression. And so what does this both imply? Sorry? Uh, no, no. Uh, see, mu i and mu i bar, they are different. The mu that you will get from this expression will be different from the mu that you got from, that you got here. I mean mu subscribe to j bar. No. Because you pick j bar. Mu j bar is strictly less than 0. Yeah, so j bar is not there, here. It's there. It's here. Yeah. Uh, not really. <laughs> Let me, I don't think that's the contradiction here. Okay. So let's see what, what do we get. So let's subtract this from here. So what I have is summation mu i minus mu bar i a i i not in i in a bar x k plus mu j bar a j bar or whatever negative is equal to 0. What does this mean? Remember that mu j bar is strictly negative. Okay, mu j bar is strictly negative. And yes, okay. What does this mean? I have non-zero vectors, strictly non-zero vec. Uh, sorry, non-zero variables, strictly non-zero variable here. And these vectors a1, a2, a3, or whatever i in x bar, a bar, x k, and a j bar, uh, they all add up to a zero vector. What does that mean? that a i, i in a x k are not linearly independent. Okay? And that contradicts our hypothesis where we said that we have removed all the redundant constraints. Therefore, all the vectors here have to be linearly, inde linearly independent, right? So, so our hypothesis was that a i, i in a x k are linearly independent, okay? That was our hypothesis because we have removed all the redundant constraints. So that cannot happen. Linear dependence cannot happen at the set of active constraints. Okay, but that's what we are seeing here. So it sort of con it contradicts our initial hypothesis, and therefore our d bar k must necessarily be not equal to zero. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, and now of course when now that we have proved that d bar k is not equal to zero, using the same analogy as we did for the previous case you know, case dk not equal to 0, we'll have that gradient using same analogy as before, gradient of fxk transpose d bar k should be less than equal to minus half d bar k transpose hk d bar k will be strictly less than 0, okay? So this would imply that d bar k is a descent direction. So we prove both these results.
okay we can also show that d bar k is a feasible direction that is if you take a step along this direction d bar k you don't go out of the constraint set okay so that's another thing that needs to be shown but it's a trivial affair so i won't do it on the board but just like what we did you know some sort of manipulation with expressions and with uh, variables you can do the same thing to prove that if you move along d bar k you take a small step along this direction d bar k you will not go out of the constraint set so if you look at this figure what we have is i am standing at xk i realize that this constraint 2 had to be removed so this is my d bar d bar k okay after removing the constraint if i take a small step along this direction i won't i won't violate the constraint right when would i violate the constraint if i take a step here okay but i'm taking a small step i'm not taking a very large step so if i take a small step i'm not violating the constraint okay so that is the description of uh manifold sub optimization method it can work for arbitrary non linear function if you use it for linear function where fx is c transpose x then uh, it's called a simplex method one of the oldest methods for solving linear programming problems and uh, it's fairly famous uh, fairly common to use in real life uh, so so that's the this is how you would implement this method so you have to implement this simplex method in for one problem in assignment 3 so you will have to learn the inner workings of how this algorithm is working you will see it in action for a problem in which visualization cannot work because it's a 100 dimensional problem okay so you'll have to work with equations and develop your intuition okay any question so far okay so i want to comment a little bit about linear programming because it's very important class of optimization problem let's say i have a constraint set that looks like this okay and this is given by a of x less than equal to b and i have a linear program so i want to minimize c transpose x such that ax less than equal to b so what i'm going to do is give you a pictorial proof of the claim that if an optimal solution exist to this problem it has to be at one of these vertices okay well let me let me make more vertices so you so this is my ax less than equal to b so if a solution exist for this problem it will be either at this vertex this vertex this vertex or this vertex and if it is not at one of these four vertices then there is no solution to this optimization problem okay that's a very famous result and it works in general for any minimization of concave function over a convex set the minimum would always be attained at one of the extreme points and for this set these are the extreme points okay and of course somewhere at infinity there will be an extreme point here and an extreme point here so what's the what's the proof so remember that c transpose x would look something like this this is c transpose x equal to 5 c transpose x equal to 4 c transpose x equal to 3 right so as you keep moving this plane you're changing the value of by the way what is c trans what is this vector c c is the outward normal of this plane okay so this is c transpose x equal to 5 c transpose x equal to 4 c transpose x equal to 3 and then as you can see 
the optimal point will be here, which will be whatever C transpose x equal to 2.5. Okay, so no matter how you orient the C vector, there will always be one point which is at the vertex at which the optimal solution would lie, always. Assuming that an optimal solution exists for this problem. Assuming that there is a solution to this particular problem. Any, any question on that particular result? Okay, now consider this case. Where this is my C transpose x equal to 3, C transpose x equal to 2, C transpose x equal to 1. Okay, then you have two vertices, one vertex here and the other one here. Both of these are optimal solution to this optimization problem. Okay, so at the very least, you will have one vertex that is a solution. And in some cases, you will have an entire face of this polygonal region, which is going to be the optimal solution. So in particular, these two endpoints will also be optimal solution to that optimization problem. So what we are doing in the simplex method, if you remember, if you remember what we are doing in the simplex method, is jump from one vertex to another vertex to another vertex, okay? And so in the process, you are going to cover all the vertices, but what is true is every time you move from one vertex to another, you know that you have taken a step in the descent direction, so the value of the function will always reduce, okay? So whenever you take a step, you make sure that the value of the function is going to reduce, and in the end, you will reach the vertex that has the minimum cost. Okay, that's why simplex method is so famous, is because for linear programs, you know that a solution would be at one of the vertices, and starting from an arbitrary vertex, if you use the simplex method, starting from an arbitrary vertex, you will keep moving from vertex to another vertex, making sure that you are always decreasing the cost in that process, and overall, your total objective will reduce and you will reach the minimum if it exists within that bounded region. All right, any question so far? No questions? All right, then we'll meet on Wednesday. And what we'll do on Wednesday is as follows. Here, we were moving from vertex to vertex. On, in Wednesday, we will go from this point through the interior of the set to this point, okay? So that's a, a fine scaling method and we'll talk about that on the Wednesday class. <laughs>